start to finish and, and would be interested in awarding ideas that we have planned in the future. Kind of master planning yeah. type things. All right. Good, excellent. Thank you. 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 They began in the self-insured department doing medical bills review. That was a lot of fun. So much. Yeah. <laughs> and he's moved on from there to handling handling the self-insured claims. As a member of the association services department, he handles the partnership with over 50 different trade organizations and chambers of commerce, including the OCA. His topic today is Ohio Workers' Compensation 101. Please welcome Adam. Good afternoon, everybody. I promise I will not be the one to keep you from uh, beating rush hour traffic. I'm going to keep this pretty short. Uh, really, I'm just going to go over a little bit of who comp management is, what we do, and uh, our partnership with the OCA. And we'll actually go over a few of the premium reduction programs that you can access by going through OCA and comp management, uh, why that benefits you, why that benefits OCA. Uh, we'll go over some really high level cost containment strategies, ways that you can keep your claims costs down before, during, and uh, even possibly after claims. Uh, I'm going to hit a few upcoming dates. I'm sure you guys have all dealt with the changeover to prospective billing, and there's been a lot of uh, new dates and processes thrown at everybody. So I'm going to highlight a few of the more important ones, including the true up process. And some good news that actually we just heard of a few days ago, a third million back has been announced by the Bureau. It still needs to be voted on, but it's uh, more or less a certainty. So I will go into a little bit of why you should not be throwing out an email from the Bureau as it may be a check. Uh, comp management, we have been in Ohio since 1984, and we are one of the largest third-party administrators in the state. Uh, we provide risk management solutions to over 30,000 employers, and we've been endorsed by more than 160 associations and chambers of commerce. And what we do is, as I said earlier, cost control. Now that involves a few different things. That involves the claims themselves. So if you have a claim, comp management would actually handle the paperwork, would handle the management, would handle uh, hearing representation, that sort of thing, making sure that the claim is moving forward towards completion as it should. The, uh, the medical management side is actually handled by a second organization, which is called the Managed Care Organization, or MCO. You guys probably dealt with open enrollment last year. I'm happy to say that this year is not an open enrollment year, so we will have a much quieter May than you did last year. Uh, we also do policy management. And what that means is we'll look at your policy, your claims history, and we'll see which premium reduction program is most cost effective for you uh, beyond the uh, major products of group rating and group retrospective rating. There's also the destination excellence programs, including the, uh, the drug-free safety program. And a lot of this boils down to whether or not it is worth your time investment versus what you will receive in premium reduction. So we kind of do that on our end, and our actuarial department will look into that for you. Uh, we also offer risk management. So we're going to talk to you about what you're doing at your cemetery to prevent injuries, what you could possibly be doing better, what we should be looking for. <clears throat> we also handle employer advocacy, which, as I said, is hearing attendance. So if you have a claim that does end up going to hearing, whether that's for allowance of a claim, meaning you're saying that this claim should not be allowed because this injured worker hurt himself over the weekend, or perhaps this injury is not directly related to the incident that did occur at work. We will represent you at the Industrial Commission, which, for lack of a better word, is the court of workers' comp here in Ohio. Uh, we also handle rates and underwriting, so again, we have an entire actuarial department that uh, is entirely dedicated to that for you. And again, the major programs, and the reason why most of you would probably be interested in our partnership is the alternative rating programs. 
So through OCA, members can get access to group rating and group retrospective rating, which I assume you're all familiar with. These are the ways that you can pay the Bureau of Workers' Compensation less money. For group rating, that's up to 53%, and for group retrospective rating, it varies. I'll go into that in a minute. Now, the reason why the partnership with the OCA is so important is that when you go through the OCA and comp management for these programs, a portion of the fee that you pay stays with the OCA. Almost everyone in Ohio, every employer, either goes through group rating or group retrospective rating, if they're of a significant size. <clears throat> If it's something that you're going to be doing regardless, it benefits you to keep a portion of your fee with an organization that's actively promoting your interests. I always try to hit this as hard as I can with, uh, with people who are involved with their members as the OCA is, because this is something that can directly benefit you and the OCA. Talking a little bit about those programs. <coughs> Group rating. So this pools employers together in the eyes of the Bureau, and you are seen as one entity. All these smaller employers are put in one group as group rating, and that pools the risk. So they're out able to charge you less for getting your, your workers' compensation insurance through the Bureau. If you have an immaculate claims history, you can get up to 53% reduction in what you're paying the Bureau. So obviously you'll be paying less than half what you would otherwise. Uh, to determine eligibility, we, the TPA, are going to have you fill out what's called an AC3. Now, you can either do that uh, through filling one out a paper sheet. You can do it online. You can even just call in and say, I give you permission. And more or less what an AC3 does is lets us ask the Bureau for your claim system. And that way we can make an intelligent guess on which group you would be going into and offer you a quote. So we're going to look at your costs, your payroll, your claims experience, and we are going to look at which group you would belong in, whether that's a 53% reduction group, or a 40, or a 30, or a 20. The Bureau will also review you to make sure that you're eligible to participate in group rating. So you need to have an active policy. You can't have any lapses in excess of 40 days, and your billing can be no more than 45 days past due. So more or less, you just need to be up to date on everything with the Bureau. And as I'm getting into a little bit later, there's a lot of other good reasons why you really need to be on top of everything with the Bureau since the move to prospective billing. Uh, one of the big benefits of group rating is it's an upfront discount. You're just paying less, which I think we can all agree is a good thing. There's no guesswork. You know exactly how much you're going to be paying. So there's a lot of people who prefer group rating above virtually any other program. The other major product that we have, the other major discount program, is group retrospective rating. Group retro is relatively new in comparison to group rating, but it is a viable option for employers that don't qualify for traditional group or with people who are not getting much savings. How group retro works. Instead of being based off of purely your claims history, Group Retro is an incentive-based program. It's moving forward how you're going to do. So more or less, again, we're going to pool you with other employers, and we are going to pool employers that we think will be doing a better job in the future of preventing injuries. So again, the Bureau is going to look at you all as one group, and they are going to compare the total premiums paid to what they think you should have in losses, plus a developmental factor. There's a long formula for it. I promise if any of you actually want to see it, I'm more than happy to send it to you. All my information's at the end. Uh, more or less, <clears throat> the Bureau assigns you a TEL, a total estimated loss. The Bureau is saying, due to the job codes that you've reported, your payroll, what you do, this is how much we expect you to have in claims costs and they compare that to your TML, which is your total modified losses. Those are your actual claims costs. If your actual claims costs come in below what the Bureau thinks that you should have, you'll get a refund. That's the, that's the long and short of group retro. Now, they actually look at this over three evaluation periods. 
The reason being, claims develop. You can have a claim that starts out as a simple knee sprain that ends up involving the back, involving the shoulder. So they look at it over three periods. After the end of the year in which you participate in group retro, they'll look at it 12 months after, 24 months, and 36 months. What we look for when we're considering someone for group retro, you want to look at a historical claim trend of declining loss ratio. So what this means is we want to see that you're having fewer injuries moving towards the present. We want to see that things are improving. Perhaps you've had a few bad years, but you put a safety program in place, you're getting less injuries now, things are moving along in the way we want to see, then you're a good candidate for group retro, even though your claims history may disqualify you for traditional group rating. You want to have a safety program. You want to have a transitional work program in place, if at all possible. Take advantage of salary continuation and put an emphasis on settlement. The reason for settlement, it caps claims. There's no development after a claim is settled. So some of the pros of group retro as opposed to group rating. There is the possibility of greater refunds. For anyone who has received a group retro quote, there's probably a shockingly large number at the top saying how much you can save. I would definitely encourage you to call the TPA and see how their groups have historically performed. Because more than likely, the number on their quote is the maximum possible. So see where their groups have come in in the past. Because that's going to give you a good idea of what their actuarial department is actually landing on, as opposed to the maximum possible. Uh, one of the other pros is the maximum risk known will be known at the beginning. So what this means is, I said that if your total modified losses come in lower than what the Bureau expects for your losses, you'll get a refund. If they're higher, you could end up owing more. So group retro is something of a gamble. <clears throat> the cons, again, it's not an upfront discount. You will get this money in the future based on performance. And again, over projection of refunds. I can't overstate that enough. I would definitely contact the TPA after receiving any group retro quote. I only have about nine minutes, so I'm gonna move pretty quickly on this. Uh, in general, does anyone here not have a safety program in place already at your secretary? Very good. It's absolutely basic, you must have one. You need to have accident prevention, training regularly. The more often you can drill it into everyone how important safety is, the less likely claims are to happen. Wellness is something that obviously is very large just in general these days amongst almost everyone. If you can encourage health, fitness, all that, that's also going to work to prevent injuries. Uh, the regular training, again, the more regular you can make this, if you can have a, a weekly, a bi-weekly, a monthly safety meeting, even if it's only for half an hour, that would be huge. You want to have some documents always on hand and always on file. You want an injured worker statement for the person who actually received the injury, witness statements, and supervisor statements. And you want those all filled out as soon as possible. Obviously, medical care needs to be provided immediately. When I have the bullet point of necessity here, make sure that outside medical care is actually needed. If it's a matter of a splinter, a small cut, something that isn't going to require outside medical care, you don't need to absolutely treat it as a, an incident that needs recorded, that sort of thing. You want to investigate it immediately. So when I say you want that paperwork filled out as quickly as possible, I mean if you can have it signed that day, if someone needs to go to the emergency room, don't stop them to fill out their paperwork first. But by all means, witnesses, supervisors, those need to be filled out and actually signed as soon as possible. These are some red flags. I'm not going to go over all of them. Some of the really big ones, if a worker comes in on Monday with an injury that they said occurred Friday, that's a major red flag. If you have someone who has been having disciplinary issues, another major red flag. These are just things that you want to look at where it's possible the claim is not actually legitimate. These are things that you want to be looking at. Again, no one wants to think that an employee is going to file a bad claim, but it does happen. Just things that you might want to second guess things. 
Uh, certification, again, make sure you're comfortable with the injury. Make sure that the first report of injury was filled out by the doctor and that causality was signed. There's a little box on the first report of injury that the doctor can either check, is this injury work-related, yes or no? If it's checked no, then you really want to look at those medical notes before you're saying, okay, this is a good injury, let's move forward. Uh, be aware that rejecting a valid claim can increase costs. Obviously, if you're retaining an attorney, uh, hearing attendance, there's all types of costs that can be associated with it. <clears throat> if you are going to be using salary continuation, there's a lot of things to consider, especially if there's any type of union contract in place. But if it is going to be used, definitely staff it with your TPA. I'm running short on time, so I'm going to, again, kind of just pull this stuff pretty quickly. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you want to maintain contact with the injured worker. Communication is key. An injured worker who's sitting at home, completely cut off from the workplace, is going to feel more alienated, possibly more uh, more hostile towards the whole process. You want to be in contact with the MCO, the TPA, the injured worker, the doctor. You want to make sure that the lines of communication are always open. And you want to notify the TPA of any changes in duty status immediately. So some big dates again. <clears throat> Hopefully, you've all been notified by this by your TPA or the Bureau. Obviously, with new perspective billing, you've had to get the estimate of your payroll. March 31st is the last day you have to request a change in the estimated payroll. So if the Bureau sent you an estimated payroll that was way off, you cut staff, you added staff, March 31st is your last day. It's also your last day to change the installment plan. <clears throat> May 1st, the Bureau is going to nail they all be premium notice for the 2017 policy year. May 31st is the deadline for the Destination Excellence Programs. So I talked about the Drug Free Safety Program, the Industry Specific Safety Program, the Transitional Work Bonus Program. The deadline is May 31st to make sure you're signed up for all of those. On June 1st, the Bureau is going to mail the invoice for the 2017 policy year. On June 30th, the first installment payment for 2017 is due. July 1st, the Bureau is going to mail the true up notice for the 2016 policy year. I'm going to talk about the true up for just a second here. I'm going to get through a couple more dates, then I'll go back. <clears throat> August 15th, the true report premium payment deadline for the 2016 year. The survey date isn't going to really affect most of you. The survey date is the date that we actually take a snapshot and look at claims. So again, it's not something that anything is due, anything you have to do, it's more something for us. And November 20th is the group rating deadline. So that's the big one. The vast majority of employers are in the group rating. So November 20th is the deadline for group rating. The true up process. Hopefully everyone is on board with the true up process because I've been trying to hit this hard in all of my presentations and all of our communications for the last year or so. So more or less all this is, you have to reconcile your actual payroll with the estimate from the previous year. It should be fairly simple to fill out. The Bureau is not always the best with that, but I feel like they've done a pretty good job with the true reports. <clears throat> you will not have your coverage lapsed if you do not fill out the true up on time, but what you will have happen is you'll be removed from your premium reduction programs, and you will owe the difference. So if, for instance, you were in a 53% premium reduction group and you were not to perform your true up in a timely fashion, the Bureau will remove you from that group and you will owe the difference. So it would more or less be doubling your workers' compensation costs for the previous year. Extremely, extremely important. If you have any questions about the true up, you can reach out to your TPA, you can reach out to the Bureau, you can reach out to me even if you're not with us. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or guide you through the process. You can submit them online, in person, or by phone. Obviously, I've got the information right there. <clears throat> you also will be ineligible for future discount programs until it's complete. But again, the big thing is that you'll more or less be guaranteeing yourself a second bill, which I don't think anybody wants to see, especially with third billion back, which <clears throat> if it is approved at the April 28th meeting, how much is this going to be? More or less, the Bureau has taken in more money than it needs as a government entity, and they are going to be issuing partial refunds back to employers. So for private employers, you're looking at two-thirds 
of what you paid for the policy year ending June 30th, 2016. So you will actually be receiving a check from the Bureau. As long as you are up to date, as long as you are up to date with everything for the end of that year and are currently up to date, you shouldn't have to do anything. The check will just go in the mail and you will actually get it. And it looks like they're, they're planning on sending it out mid-summer. So you should probably expect that by the end of July, I would say, at the latest. It does still have to be voted on <clears throat> on April 28th, but again, from what I understand from what we're hearing from the Bureau, this is pretty much a foregone conclusion, and uh, you should be expecting the check. And then just under the wire. So, uh, again, feel free to reach out to me at any time for anything, for any questions, even if you're not with us. All my contact information is right there. And uh, I'm glad that I was at least able to end this presentation with some good news about the third going back. I don't always get to do that. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Adam? We all love talking about workers. <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI, um, like if you're working with ADP Total Scores, they handle all my workers' comp stuff. So. It's another good thing. Uh, again, thank you very much. No, no questions? Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Last but certainly not least. Do we have any errors No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> not that one out there. Yeah, okay. Um, our last speaker is our own Kirk Roberts. Uh, Kirk and his family operate multiple cemeteries, funeral homes, and, and a crematory in Ohio. Kirk started selling pre need cemetery property in 1986 moved into operations in 1999, and then moved back into the sales and marketing uh, part of the business in uh, 2012. In 2015, Kirk was invited to become a part of the Topper Study Group, an invitation only 25 member group of industry leaders in sales and marketing that meets annually to discuss opportunities facing the cemetery, funeral, and cremation market. He will be speaking on marketing today's cremation families, uh, which is a, a topic that he was actually part of a panel um, <laughs> that was discussed that discussed this topic uh, back back in January, I believe, at the ICCFA Wide World of Sales. So please give a warm welcome to Kirk Roberts. Thank you. 
Thanks, I appreciate it. Well, it's good. I can't see this for a while, but you know, you've got to have a little bit of humor. I know I'm the last speaker. I'm going to talk really slow. I'm going to go 20 minutes over so everybody gets caught in traffic. So um, <laughs> no, we'll get through this. Um, if you can't tell, this is the uh, uh, classic running of the bulls uh, in Spain. Uh, the caption underneath says tradition. Just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. <laughs> so, so let's just you know get a, a change of mindset a little bit. Um, let's, uh, open ourselves up to some different ideas and different ways of doing things. Uh, we're going to today talk about um, uh, understanding the market, the cremation market, um, and help you get an idea for some of this, the statistics that, uh, that's out there going across the country and the state. Talk about creating some viable solution. Educating the community and then the actual presentation of uh, presenting your cremation items, options uh, to families. So let's get right into it. Uh, understanding your market. Uh, number one, why families choose cremation. Uh, there are a lot of uh, misinformation, misunderstandings. People think that the number one reason people choose cremation is money. It is not. Uh, money is actually very far down the list as far as people's preference. Uh, one of the things that people say, they want to make it easier, they're trying to make the whole process easier on their family. Uh, it does become a personal preference uh, option. Um, it has just become more accepted. Um, and money is actually pretty far down the list. So once you kind of have that in your head, don't get hung up on the money. If you build value, they will spend the money. It's not an issue. <laughs> um, interesting information, the higher the education, the higher the income level of these families, the higher the cremation rate. This is not, again, money driven. Um, matter of fact, in some of the poorer parts of the country, you know, some parts through the Rust Belt, the Bible Belt, uh, the cremation rate actually goes down. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a little different than what people think, so we need to understand that. Ohio, the cremation rate is 41%. I think in 2015 is the first time across the country the cremation rate passed 50% in the country. Uh, obviously, there are pockets across the country that the cremation rate is much higher. Uh, California, Florida, um, uh, up east, Maine, uh, those <coughs> parts of the country, uh, Washington, uh, those areas, they've got cremation rates pushing 80% uh, in some of those markets. Um, so it's coming. Um, uh, there's no reason to stick our head in the sand. Uh, let's just be prepared to deal with it. Uh, the worst statistic on here um, is that those families who are choosing cremation, only 17% are planning on going to a cemetery with their cremated remains. That's much lower than anyone ever anticipated, but that is the national number. Uh, people are going to funeral homes. See, cemeteries think that their cremation rate isn't that high. They say, oh, ours is only 25%. That's because you're not seeing them at all. <laughs> they are going to the they're going to the funeral home, they're being cremated, they're taking them home. You don't even know that death, death existed. You don't know what ever happened. So your numbers are probably skewed because of that. So we have to find out how to get to those families. Um, next, we're going to talk about creating some viable solutions. We've got uh, lots of suppliers here uh, this week, uh, today, and lots and lots of cremation options. I wonder why. Uh, take advantage of these uh, different organizations, uh, some of them uh, for profit, some of them others. Uh, glass front dishes are the most popular across the country. This is all the information I'm getting from uh, these other organizations. They still are the most popular. If you can get inside some structure in your building and get some uh, niches, glass front niches, you need to have some different price points for these families to choose from. Uh, outdoor columbariums, obviously, uh, cremation gardens, um, scattering versus ossuaries versus uh, cenotaphs. Um, a cenotaph, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a memorial in a cemetery for someone who's not buried there. So there is a name for it, uh, people think it's cool. Um, but those families who have chosen scattering somewhere else can still be memorialized in your cemetery. We have to sell the benefits of that permanent memorialization. We're gonna talk about that more uh, in a little bit. But you have to really take your time, do your research, get a company that has done this before, they're all out there, a lot of them are willing to uh, to do it for minimal or low or no cost. Uh, they're happy to help you design the garden if you use their products. Um, let them get a desert, uh, garden designed for you. Take advantage of their uh, skill and knowledge um, and get a cremation garden. You have to get something started. Uh, 
Os uh, scattering is an option for uh, cemeteries uh, to be done in the cemetery. Uh, some cemeteries believe in it, some, ter some cemeteries don't. Um, our opinion, uh, not that it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but our opinion is all cremated remains should be recoverable. As a cemetery, that's what our philosophy is. Uh, if they want to scatter, um, they can scatter somewhere else and still memorialize there. If they want us to dispose of the, of the cremated remains, uh, we can do different, we have different options, but we are going to make sure that those are recoverable because people do change their mind. Uh, we've had several families over the years come back and say, you know, we had separated these cremated remains, we now want to put them back together, but the one brother who took them decided he was going to put it in the lake and now we can't reunite these cremated remains. It is a very obvious and very permanent solution. Um, but uh, a lot of cemeteries do offer scattering of cremated remains, uh, and it's certainly a viable option. Hey, um, yes? Uh, we uh, just opened a scattering room, and uh -huh. we, because we're a government cemetery, we have them, uh, we developed a form called an irrecoverable remains policy mm -hmm. so that they know that they're no longer able to be recovered. Correct. And that, helps with that conversation at least getting that started. It doesn't answer the question 10 years from now. Sure. But at least initially they understand the permanency of the scatter. That's a very good point. The more information we can get to these families ahead of time, the better decisions they're going to be able to make. It's just one of those things. Um, next, let's talk about educating your community. This is one of the most important things that we can do um, because what's happening is these, these families, this, let's say this, this couple, this married couple for 15, 20 years says, you know what, I just want to cremate it, I want to throw it out in the backyard. And they just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. He dies, she comes in, and she is single-minded, and she's not open-minded to anything other than having him cremated and thrown out in the backyard. At that point, and on an ad need basis, those families are nearly impossible to educate because they are not open-minded because he's dead and he's not there to, to say, you know what, it's okay if we have service. So it's, this is vitally important to have these families uh, uh, educated ahead of time. If I can get in front of a couple, a husband and wife, and he says, I just want cremated and throw it out in the backyard, I can chuckle with him. I said, I get it. That's the way most guys feel. Most men really don't care, but it's really not about us, is it? You know, and we can have that conversation. And he's reasonable, and she's listening to the conversation. These families have to be educated ahead of time. Um, at date, again, it's much more difficult. There is a, a new term in addition to you know, what we traditionally know as pre date and at date, and that's post date. Post date is the, the, uh, the largest growing um, demographic or market in our industry are those cremated families that are taking the cremated remains home. It's a growing number of people who work as a cemetery side. We never see them, we never engage with them, we never get to show them their options. What they're finding is, and what they're still working on, but what we're finding is six months after the cremation is the time that you can begin to market to these families and give them some generic mailings, some pieces, you know, if they see something on Facebook or, or somewhere along those lines where they say, you know what, I was supposed to cremate these remains and I never got around to it, look, I do have another option. Because that's what's happening six months, a year down the road. They never get around to the service or the party. Remember that people talk about, oh, I just want to have a big party. Well, the party never happens because three days after the burial, everybody goes back. Everybody goes back to work, or three days after the cremation, everybody goes back to their normal lives, and you never get around to having the party. It just never happens. You never get around to doing the scattering. You never get around to um, getting to his hunting camp in West Virginia. You know, it, it's an effort to do these things, and thus the. Term how they get cremated remains out of the closet because that's where they end up, or in the attic, or in the basement. Or uh, there was one lady that she kept him in the trunk of her car. She was afraid if there was ever a house fire, you know, but she didn't think about what if her car got stolen, you know. <laughs> so, and, and people don't think about all of these things and the importance of getting these cremated remains into permanent placement in the cemetery. Um, social media can work. Uh, one of the other big uh, items that uh, they're having a lot of success with are seminars. Um, people want to learn about these, but they don't want to call a cemetery, they don't want to call a funeral home, because it's too close to home. But if they can go to a seminar, a lunch and learn, uh, uh, we're, we've uh, done a, uh, one of the uh, Talk of a Lifetime programs that went exceptionally well. 
If you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, the uh, FAMIC, which is the Funeral and Memorial Information Council, um, which is a bunch of industry people have come together. They created all the material. The material is all done. The presentations are done. The invitations are done. The artwork for the advert for the newspapers are done. Um, it's all ready to go, uh, and they're, they're good little programs. It's a nice, it's a, uh, a nice way to get in front of some people without sounding like, oh, we're going to talk about information. You know, this is you know, there's enough information out there. Is what I'm saying is uh, to take advantage of uh, these opportunities and get in front of these families and get them educated. Um, so those are all things that we can do. Uh, finally, the presentation. Um, and I really, I know I'm moving through this quickly, but I really want to spend a little bit of time here. This is the most important thing, is when you get in front of these families, how do you get them to, to say, yes, it's okay to have a service, yes, it's okay to have a viewing in, and yes, it's okay to get some permanent placement into the cemetery. The first thing we have to do is build value in what we're doing. We're, don't forget to build value in their life and what, the, what we're really talking about. Get their kids involved. You know, I know they're not there, not involved at the moment, but talk about their kids. How would your, how many children, adult children do you have? How many grandchildren do you have? How would they be impacted at the time of your death? How are they going to respond? And they'll tell you how every one of their kids are going to act. Oh, Sally's going to be a mess. She's going to say, oh, blah, blah, blah. we've already talked about information, and she just flips out. I'm thinking, why would you want to force her to go through that? I don't say it yet, but we'll get there. But build value in that. Uh, share the, there's some research done by Kena, and it's, for some reason, uh, it's not, not talked about very much. But there was a um, sociologist at the Northern Kentucky University that had done a study for Kena. And what she did, she went back and researched all these families who had had uh, privations in their family back several years. I don't know how long, but she went back. What she found is that if you skip too much of the process, the big three, what I call the big three, if you skip the viewing, even if it's a private family viewing, it doesn't have to be the whole big two, four hour, three day event or whatever. If you skip the viewing, if you skip some type of a service or gathering, you know, if people don't want to have a service, call it a gathering if you skip that. And if you skip the permanent memorialization, in her terms, you're actually hijacking the grief process. And I share this with every family I talk to that's going to be cremated. And they start to think, oh, I guess it does. You know, if you can go through the stages of grief and assign a stage of grief to each one of these items and say that by skipping that, you're, you're, you're not allowing your family to go through this part of the process, they get stuck. So we're trying to help. So, and it explained that they have options that without breaking the bank, that they can still do all of these things, still honor your wishes, and make it available to your family. So I've got a story. This is a true story. This is a family I dealt with uh, seven, eight years ago, maybe, maybe not that long. I had actually gone to school with one of the daughters. Uh, her dad died, and they came out to make arrangements. And um, the, the wife was there, the daughter that I knew, Two other siblings, another daughter and another son. So we have everybody's in the room. Wife says, uh, we go to the time where we say, well, what day would we like to have a service? She goes, we're not having a service. This is the wife. And the kids are like, what? What do you mean we're not having a service for dad? we got all these people who are already calling us wanting to know what time the service is going to be. What day and time? She said, no, we're not having a service. Said, why? why? Why won't you let us have a service for dad? Because your dad made me promise for 20 years not to have a funeral service for him. Could you imagine all those years he's sitting at the kitchen table and I don't want a service. I don't want people fussing over me. I don't want people looking at me. I don't want people, you know, all this. I don't want people crying over me. All these things that we've all heard different people say all those years. Kids just had a fit. Finally she bent. She was fine. You want to have a service? Have a service. The day the funeral service comes. Everybody's there. Everybody's talking. You know how it is. Everybody's visiting. Kids are kind of broken up in different parts of the room, visiting with people that they know, their friends, grandkids. Looked around there for somebody missing. Could you imagine sitting at home while your family is honoring the life of your husband that you were married to for so many years out of guilt because he made you promise not to have a service? 
please use that story. If I could have sat down with him for five minutes and said, would you please tell your family your wishes that you don't want to have service? But if it's that important to them, will you please at least just give them permission? That's all they need. Would you at least give them permission? He never says no to me. Never. It's that important. We have to get these emotions built back into these families. We're missing the emotion part. So many people skip it. I think it's not important. Nobody wants to get anybody upset or anything, you know? So you have to make sure you offer these options, explain these things, tell these stories, build the emotion back into it, build the value back into the viewing, build the value back into the gathering. You know, folks, everybody has a shoebox full of pictures. And what's the first thing we do when we go and have a death? We start going back and going through all those pictures, don't we? Because it's important we're remembering that's that person's life. That's the purpose of the service and the gathering, is to remember these people, not the rich people. Sure, we can do cremation, but don't forget the important part. The important part is having a service. Don't forget, logic tells. We can tell all the information, tell all how great all of our stuff is, which is great. We have wonderful options for people for cremation. But don't forget the emotional part. That's the important thing. And then you have to close once you've made a presentation. Once you've explained all the options, you got their head nodding, you have to close. You have to help them make decisions. People traditionally are terrible decision makers because we don't make decisions very often. You know, the average person, they go to work, they're told what to do, how to do it every day, they go back home, their wife tells them what to do, how to do it every day. Right? <laughs> um, they're not good at making decisions. We have to help them decide, we have to help them make these decisions, get them committed, get them taken care of. So when there is a debt, they don't have to go through all this. That's the important part of this. So I found a video. I actually had seen a video at, a, at another presentation. And it really explains how we can help get these families that, that emotional pull. Um, I'm going to show this at the next uh, Talk of a Lifetime uh, thing we have. But this was from the um, one of the Mad Men series, I've never seen, seen the TV show Mad Men, um, but they were advertising uh, the old Kodak carousel things. Remember, they were an advertising agency and they were, gonna, uh, they were selling Kodak on how they can present this and sell it, but it really kind of fits over. So we're going to cross our fingers and hope that the sound works, because if it doesn't, it's not going to be much. Joe Barron, Lynn Taylor. No way. Facility, but they don't take vacations. What do they show? Slice of working? <laughs> so, have you figured out a way to work the wheel into it? We know it's hard because wheels aren't really seen as exciting technology, even though they are the original. Well, technology is a glittery lure. But uh, there's a rare occasion when public can be engaged on a level beyond flash if they have a sentimental bond with the product. My first job, I was in-house at a fur company with this old pro copywriter, Greek, named Teddy. And Teddy told me the most important idea in advertising is new. It creates an itch. You simply put your product in there as a kind of cow mine lotion. We also talked about a deeper bond with the product. Nostalgia. It's delicate. The poop. Twitter.
to go again. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. Let's just travel the way a child travels. Round and round, back home again. Thank you very much.